What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Podium. I'm Kaylee Browning. And I'm David Radulovich. And today we are topi- talking about one of my favorite topics. Yeah. We are hitting on the mental game. And as you all know, we broke this into a three-part series. And today is the beginning part of those series. And we also reached out to you all on Instagram um, via social media to give us some questions, so listen through this episode because you're probably going to see some of your names and your questions come up during the episode. Yeah. I, so, I mean, right off the bat, thank you guys for participating because social media is only like, it's. I mean, we can't even measure the age of it in weeks yet. Yeah. And we have like a thousand people following us and, uh, and you guys like engaged with us on really good questions. Uh, and, and so, I mean, we couldn't leave them out of the episode, so... Uh, thanks a lot for participating, and I, like seriously, if I can encourage that more in the future, um, that's a really good way to get involved in the podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we want to answer the questions that you have and give y'all some of our wisdom that we have obtained over our experiences, and that's kind of I think what we try to do in this episode today. Um, and y'all, y'all came up with some good questions, like questions that made us sit down and think, like, hmm, how. Hmm, what is the answer to that? You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, for me, when I was reading the questions, I was like, dang, that's a good question. My mind just works faster than you. Probably. So I, just listen, just because I talk slower and I have an accent <laughs> doesn't mean what's going on upstairs I like isn't that working. That was, an, that was an example of thinking quick. Yeah. <laughs> See? Quick thinker right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we took some time in order to try to understand a direction to go in this episode and in this series, David and I took some time to figure out exactly what our mental game was ourselves and how we acquired a mental game and what works for us. And this is actually really cool because David and I both went into separate rooms and sat down and we said, okay, what are the different phases, every phase that you can think of that you went through in your career that was a quote unquote, a mental game phase. Yeah. You know, we, we really tried to dig deep into figuring out every phase that we went through. And we took about an hour and a half to do that, I would say. And we came back to compare notes. And do y'all want to know who copied who here? No. I, y- yeah, I, yeah. You don't want I them to not. know. You don't <laughs> want them to know. We came up with exactly 11 different phases that we had been through each. Yeah. Which was pretty cool. I mean, how often can you say that we... Sh- well, I mean, we started out in the same sports, you know, but I, I switched pretty early. You so, just couldn't cut it with the big dogs. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, we ended up having exactly 11 phases each, which was awesome. Yeah, it was really interesting because um, we... I mean, not only was it about... Uh, you know, we went through 11 different phases of kind of like what we were thinking how we were thinking uh the also like we were feeling yeah how that was impacting our our shooting yeah how like how we would interpret external situations around us and how that influenced the way that we would compete Mm -hmm. um and we kind of we went we started from the very beginning when we both first started shooting and just kind of almost relived that journey as we were writing things down and it was interesting to see that not only did we feel like we but i mean without talking to each other ended up determining that we went through kind of the same amount of of stages but also it was I mean, we, we decided to label them different names, but mm-hmm. in, in terms of what we actually went through, internally and emotionally, it was the same. And the timing was impeccable. I mean, yeah. we might have been like, I might have been in a year longer phase than he was or vice versa, but overall, we were pretty much in the same 11 phases for about the same amount of time, yeah. which is insane. Well, I think it kind of speaks volume to what we did because... You know, the two of us have about 20 years of shooting um, each. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can look back on some of our friends that are younger than us uh, or students that we have that we uh, are kind of trying to help progress through these stages. And you'll see a lot of times that, you know, I mean, it's very rare for someone 
like us to have a student who's been in the game equally as long. Yeah. You know, 20 years is a long it's a time. a long time. I mean, we're getting old over here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Uh, but the... Uh, but as we, you know, as I work with students, obviously I've been shooting for 20 years. I haven't been teaching for 20 years. Um, and as I work with students, I see them go through those same exact phases uh, emotionally and in terms of their confidence and their self-image and how they're experiencing and interpreting, uh, you know, struggles and failures and successes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of really interesting to watch that although we may decide to name them different things and they're caused by different experiences that we each um, I guess experience. Uh, I think everyone kind of has a natural progression of how they go through things yeah. in terms of their journey towards trying to reach the pinnacle of whatever they're really trying to do. For sure. Yeah. And um, we've been through those experiences. And so we are here to kind of, you know, if I, if I was looking back and I had somebody um, that I looked up to that had been through some similar experiences that I have been through that have has competed as long as I had. If I had somebody to help me in that situation at that time, to kind of mold me and guide me and navigate me through those hard times, I mean, that would have been, that's invaluable, you know? I mean, you cannot, you can't put a price on that. I think that like when you and I were going through this, um, you know, I mean, sports psychology was a thing, but mm-hmm. at least in my sport, I mean, it was such a... 20 years ago, Sporting Clays was maybe 20 years old, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I mean, it was such a, a green, new, uh, kind of like unthought about game in the United States that, uh, I mean, not to say that there weren't really good people in the game, but we didn't really know that much. Yeah. And we, uh, I mean, they're really in in the U.S. at least. Um, the be- some of the best shooters, uh, you know, were kind of learning as they go. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of interesting to look at the history of shooting in the U.S., um, especially in, in sporting class. I, I can't really speak towards your game, but you know, like you could look at different um, generations and kind of like the, the the generation that taught my generation, which is essentially the second, were kind of the guys that had to figure it out themselves. Yeah. And then. Um, you know, t- brought that information to us and then we're kind of able to couple the two things together of learned experience and uh, and learned information yeah. uh, or told information. And so, like, the mental game, you know, if you think about 20 years ago and, and if you had a coach that said, okay, you got to look at this, you know, read this book or do this thing, there wasn't really that much about that. Yeah, back there then. wasn't really that. O- I'm sure it was there, but there wasn't really that option. It wasn't talked about too much. Yeah, you know, and we didn't have that access to yeah. that information as easy as we do now. Yeah, and and now I mean it's 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 a whole field, and yeah. I mean not to say that it wasn't 20 years ago, but at least it carrying itself into the shooting now, sports. It's like essential in your oh. performance now. Yeah, you, know, you think yeah. back then it was all fundamental, 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 and a little bit on our middle game. Like let's get. And yeah, when think I say, positive. Yeah, or, let's think positive. Let's not goof off before we shoot. It was things like that. Yeah. But now it's almost transitioned into once you learn the fundamentals, especially in my sport, it becomes 90% mental. Yeah. Well, look at the progression of of um, talent in both games. So oh, you go back. I mean, yeah. if you go back 20 years ago in, spor- yeah, in sporting plays, I remember if you could shoot – like a 185 in a sporting class match out of 200 you were definitely going to win yeah now i mean on harder targets if you don't shoot a 192 ish you're not going to win yeah and so through the necessity of people getting better what ends up happening is that you also have to try to figure out other ways to get uh, to improve where you're at currently yeah and i think that so like what ends up happening is, you know, everybody kind of has a good mechanics and good technique and everybody's kind of on the same page. But then through trying to beat each other and be more successful and make an income, we start to experiment with other things like mm-hmm. nutrition or, or sports psychology or whatever it is. And so it, the, the natural progression of talent pushes that research in the game. And I think that that kind of really brings up where we're talking about 
the kind of the filter that we look through this series for, which is that question that we're talking about, and, yeah. and which is, you know, at the current at the current stage of my game right now, what is it that I can do that is going to improve my score the most? Yeah. Uh, and if you if you look at that, if you look at the game through that question, if you look at your progress through that question as you go. Um, two things are going to happen. Number one, you'll find that early on, the answer to that question is a lot about mechanics, mm-hmm. and it's a lot about uh, psychology. But but later on, it ends up being more about um, more about f- psychology and more about the mental game and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Uh, to see that natural progression of things and kind of understand, you know, that even that itself kind of directed us towards how we wanted to do yeah. this. Yeah. So, okay. So let me ask you this. Yeah. In your opinion, what is a mental game? What is a mental game? What is a mental game? Like if someone was to come, someone, so we're talking about like the beginning phases right now. Yeah. So we're, we're talking to people that are listening who have probably shot a little bit, maybe they've taken some instruction, you know, they're they're familiar with their gun, they've maybe been to a few competitions, and they're kind of like, okay, I, I hear people talk about this pre-shot routine, and the pre-shot routine is going to come in our second series, but they hear people talk about a mental game, they hear people talk about, you know, how you have to be mentally focused, or my mind wasn't on it, so what exactly is, let's determine what a mental game is before we kind of get into those deeper topics here. Yeah. I think that early on in the game, a lot of people, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I need to have a better mental game or yeah. I hate the question of what's your mental game? What's, yeah. What's your mental game? What's your pre-shot routine right now? <laughs> yeah. It, the, I mean, the, when someone asks, what's your mental game? That really kind of shows what little they, that they do know or how much they don't know um because if you were to ask somebody what's your mental game a mental game is not a pre-shot routine a a pre-shot routine is part of the mental game Mm -hmm. but the mental game of a sport is it's a holistic so far beyond a pre-shot routine. it's how you live your life yeah it truly is it truly flows over into a lifestyle because if you're only practicing a, and I'm gonna do quotations here a mental game for the purpose of getting a higher score that's only gonna that's only gonna live so long that's gonna be very short-lived yeah. um, it has to become a lifestyle and with understanding that David and I kind of created a, a chart I guess mm. of things that could we we said okay. What are the qualities that you need to have? Um, I guess to kind of get to the pinnacle of your sport, and this is pertaining to non-characteristic traits and characteristic traits. Traits we categorized it into two different things. Um, so non-characteristic traits would be something like your gun, your equipment, your ammo, a coach, things like that. Characteristic. Why can I say that? Characteristic <laughs> traits. It's a tongue twister. It's that, it's that long, slow accent. It's that accent. long, slow southern accent coming out <laughs> that I'd try to get rid of. But characteristic <laughs> traits would be... You want to say it one more time slower? Characteristic. <laughs> that's like realtor. <laughs> characteristic. Okay. Is a, it, are I love things it. like your work ethic... Um, I totally just went blank after thinking about characteristics. <laughs> I distracted you. It's my fault. <laughs> you did. Would be things like your work ethic. Um, characteristics, right? So, so like personality <laughs> characteristic traits are... Are you motivated? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what how, Are you persistent? Do you persevere through through challenges? Are you a positive thinker? Yeah. Uh, do, wh- how is... What What type of ego do you have? And, mm-hmm. and we'll get to that later. That's a totally loaded question. Um, uh, you know, are you goal oriented? Mm-hmm. Are you focused? Uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we made that chart to kind of help us understand, you know, what are some things using that filter question now, what are some things that would be beneficial for somebody who is just, I mean, just scratching the surface 
of thinking about a mental game and thinking about a pre-shot routine and, and just starting to kind of be introduced to that. You yeah, know? like, you know, what do, what type of, of theme or characteristic do you need to start trying to, to push yourself towards being like or thinking like? Yeah, so... Um, uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. Okay. So, when do you think that when you first started this game, that taking into account all of the 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 personality traits and the non personality characteristics that we've that you and I have talked about outside of the podcast, and mm-hmm. and what we'll do for yeah. that is, you know, we'll we'll Let's put, put that chart on the website. Yeah, we'll put the chart up yeah. and and everything. And there's a lot of research behind that too. But anyways, so taking into account all of those things, we came up with 32 different things, mm-hmm. right? Characteristics. Do you think that when you first started the game, that you innately had all of those? Oh my gosh, no! Right. If I were to sit here and say yes. I'd be a fibber. You'd be a liar. I'd be a fibber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my pants would catch on fire, as my grandma would say. <laughs> no, a- absolutely not. I mean, personality traits, you know, you can have somebody who has just been brought up with a good work ethic, you yeah. know. Um, and I think my dad did a pretty good job of that with me. Um, but those, anything that you see in the chart are pretty much learn traits yeah. you have to put in that work to learn those traits yeah. i mean it's not something that comes easy to a lot of people for sure i think that there i would agree with you um i do know though however that speaking with some uh psychologists uh that there is some scientific evidence to say that certain and specific personality traits are pretty much determined by the time you're about seven or eight years old. Yeah, I was and, gonna say it is probably influ. I don't know. I haven't had the research on that. Um, yeah. But it's probably influenced from a very young age. And yeah. It's something you carry over into adulthood for sure. Right. And, but with that being said, I also know from talking to them that uh, those are. Th- so take for example, um, this is going to be a horrendous example because I don't have a PhD in psychology. He thinks he does sometimes. <laughs> I just talk to people that do. But take, for example, like uh, you could say an, um, an innate characteristic would be something like organization. Mm-hmm. Okay, so am I organized? Oh, no. <laughs> but, I mean, am I organized? Yeah, right. But hold on. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> but, My mother can answer that. So I'm not, Yeah. right? And, but... I believe that to be successful in a sport that you need to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, however, in life, in a way, am I innately organized? No. If you were to walk into my truck or my room, it does not, there's no organization to it, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a way. So, and this is also scientifically proven, that you can learn to compartmentalize things to where if it's a skill set that you need to accomplish something like athleticism or athletic success that you can learn to adapt and and embed that characteristic into that journey so for example if you were to look at you know like my journey in shooting and my uh, path towards success in that that would that is very organized mm-hmm. you know look at the way that that you and i teach mm-hmm. uh or that we communicate or that ideas we run our businesses yeah and yeah. it is and it is organized very. so th- that goes to show you that don't think that because you like oh my gosh well i'm not a goal oriented person i'm not a focused person I, you know the thing oh, okay well that's hopeless for me yeah right because you can learn to adapt and then also figure out well what are my strengths and weaknesses and how can i take what i'm good at and put that into a way to get me towards being successful yeah and i mean i'm the exact same way as david i I was not an organized person. I still wouldn't consider myself an organized person. I am, but I'm not. But growing up, 
I'm like right in the middle. Like oh. half my life is and half my life is just a disaster. Yeah. And if growing up, if you were to ask my mom to walk into my room, she would just have heart attacks weekly because I did. <laughs> I mean, I knew where everything was, but I just had like piles of clothes. I had, you know, it was just hmm. scattered around and it was organized to me. But to somebody who was just walking in and looking at it, they were, I mean, they would think a, a tornado had been through there recently, yeah, you yeah. know, and it drove her insane because she's the type of person that will pack for a trip yeah. three weeks ahead of time. Yeah. Yes. I'm the type of person that packs about four hours before my flight leaves. hundred yeah. percent. You know? And I mean, it's just totally different, but also in some sense, like I like the challenge of packing. <laughs> so quick you're just trying to give yourself an excuse to continue doing it yeah i like the challenge (laughs) i love it yeah and i think that organization or goal oriented is a very important quality that you have to have and that you and that you need to understand when you're thinking about a mental game and like david said it may come more natural to some people and then some people are going to have to work really hard for that Mm -hmm. because it's a it, don't fear change because if you if you fear change and you stay comfortable and you stay in this little bubble um, because you're scared to try something new you're never going to advance into what you do don't stay in your comfort zone change does not come from a comfort zone yeah yeah we talked about that the other day yeah. that um, it's a cool quote the other th- so the other thing about the mental game is that we have to understand is that. The whole purpose of a mental game. So if, when we talk about it, what is it? Go back to that original yeah. question. Okay, so uh, there are kind of two ways to tackle that question. One side, you got a psychological approach. Mm-hmm. The other side, you got a philosophical approach. So the psychological approach to a mental game would be something like, uh, it's, it's kind of like a prescriptive approach where... Let's take, for example, the fact that we're in a, I'm going to use uh, an example that like we would be in it's for you. Okay? okay. You're in. I'm your guinea you, pig. Yes. You're my guinea pig. Okay. So you made it to the Olympics. Yes. Okay. And you, you shot a qualifying score to get into the final. Yes. Okay. And you're in position one to win an Olympic gold for Tokyo Olympics. Yes. Okay. And you've got. Uh, and let's say that for some reason, I know it's not like this, but you're the last person to shoot on the squad and it's the last target. And if you hit it, you win the gold. If you miss it, you tie for silver and bronze and fourth. Oh gosh. Okay. Right. A three-way tie? Yes. Oh boy. So obviously big pressure situation, right? And you don't know what target's coming. And so you start to recognize that external situation that you're in right so it's like okay i'm in the olympic i i'm in the olympics this is for an olympic gold medal i've trained my whole life for this this is the most important shot i've ever taken in my life that i'm ever gonna take in my life right (laughs) makes you a little nervous you've got me excited now like i feel like i'm in the olympics about to compete i'm going through my mental routine right now right to prepare for this target that i'm not even (laughs) shooting (laughs) <laughs> that I'm hypothetically shooting. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Who is it? China? Yeah. Who do I got to beat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks, Corona. Yeah. So, okay, so. If you think that I'm not coming after China and the Olympics because of this Corona, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyways, back to the scenario. The, um, so that's obviously an extremely important shot. Yeah. Okay. And you recognize that. Mm -hmm. And you value that target. And like you said, it's the most important shot you're ever going to take. Yeah. Okay. How do you... I mean, right now, you're already reacting to that, right? Yeah. You're you're probably like pumped up and excited. Yeah, excited. excited. That's a physiological response to what you've deemed as something extremely important to you. Your heart rate gets up. Mm -hmm. You know, you lose control of your body. Start sweating. Right. Get nervous. So a mental game in terms of in real time is meant to take a moment like that and put you in a a, a comfortable scenario and a uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just comfortable, but also a familiar. A familiar. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nice job. Teamwork. <laughs> a familiar scenario to where you don't have that physiological response anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. And. Let me, I want to add into it right there because 
when you are in a situation like that, or when you're in any situation mm. that external factors play into your mind, you know, and make you have those reactions, make yeah. you nervous, make your heart rate get up, you know, make you have those fear-based thoughts. There are two ways that you have to train yourself. Well, there's ways that you have to train yourself to be able to get comfortable with that situation. Because let's be, let's be realistic here for a minute. How many times can you train that situation? How how am yeah. I going to train yeah. a situation that's in an Olympic final that either I hit this shot and I get a gold medal yeah. or I miss it and now I'm going to shoot off you a can't. three-way shoe off. You cannot train, you can't train that. that experience yeah. in that situation. You just have to be there. You have to be there. Yeah, it's through experience. It's Yes, it's through experience, but that's also when we kind of get into deeper in our second episode of a pre-shot routine. Yeah. You know, you, you are fully aware of what is going on here. I am fully aware. I'm aware right now, you know. I'm, <laughs> I'm fully aware that if I hit this target... I'm going to become an Olympic gold medalist. Mm-hmm. If I miss this target, I am now in a shoot off that could potentially get me in fourth place and not even get a medal yeah. at the Olympics. I'm aware of that. So yeah. how do I deal with that? And the only way to understand how to deal with that is to understand that those thoughts are going to come and you can't let those thoughts have a reaction on you. You have to recognize those thoughts because the more you push those thoughts away, the don't more you say, yeah, the more you say, okay, I don't need to think that I don't need to think about that. That's not happening. That's not reality. Well, yeah, it is reality. That's what's going on here right now. Yeah. And you have to develop tools to be able to keep your mind focused on your purpose. Mm-hmm. And what your purpose is, well, we'll get into that later, but you have to have some sort of regimen that lets your mind get back into what's a familiar state to be in yeah. to be able to compete there right so so going back to that scenario what the what you're talking about there that pre-shot routine is a part of the mental game that's just like what's happening right there part of the mental game right. that we talked about before but um so that what that's doing is it's it's changing your conscious mind's recognition of what's happening to be something familiar and something consistent so that you don't have that physiological yeah. response yeah. or at least that you can control yourself yeah. in that moment. Right? Or if you have those yeah, if you have those thoughts, being able to recognize that you're having those thoughts and have a process on how to control your reaction to those thoughts. Yes. Now <laughs> Another twist. Twist. Did I hit it? (laughs) (laughs) Or am I in a shoot off now? (laughs) (laughs) No, not like that. Mm. So, so I say that's the psychological approach to the mental game. Okay. The philosophical approach to the mental game, which is my favorite, you're going to have to tune into one of the next two episodes. (laughs) Oh, that's dirty. Yeah. Well, that's dirty. You did it dirty. (laughs) But, wow, where's the mop? Yeah, that's a cool. That's a cool part. Uh, that's where I get excited about it. Yeah. Um, but I think, what, in terms of what we're talking about right now, early on, it's more psychology based. Yeah, I would um, agree. And, and we kind of get into that at the end of what we determine to be the beginning stage. Yeah. Right. Which is what this episode is. So, why don't we go and take that, and why don't we? So what we decided the beginning stage is, right, is, do you want to, you want me to go with it? Sure. Okay. So we is, um, we decided that the beginning stage of, if, if this sounds familiar to you, you're in the beginning stage of the mental game, which is what we're talking about today. You kind of just started shooting, um, and you feel right now that there's no real need to introduce something like a mental program like a pre-shot routine or an in-event routine uh, in order to help benefit your score so pretty much right now what you're focused on is uh, what you're focused on is more mechanical Mm -hmm. you may still be dealing with with negative thoughts and nerves yeah, those, and those start those thoughts are starting to come into your mind and now you're wondering why is that there and and, and how do i deal with that because right. we got some good questions over we did over uh yeah. this particular topic yeah and and so i would say i would argue you know right now that 
if, if that's what you're dealing with, you're dealing with negative thoughts or nervous thoughts or, or anything like that while you're shooting, but you're not running a program and you don't think that, you know, like introducing that to your game right now would overcomplicate things. That's yeah, the beginning stage. Yeah, the beginning stage is, like he said, right now you, you think, okay, do I fully understand the fundamentals? Do, can I walk up into a cage, or like in my game, can I walk up into a field and be 100% confident in my fundamentals mm. right now? Like, is there a target that's going to throw me off, or can I pretty well navigate on my own? Do I have a pretty good understanding of target presentation? If you're still working on that, you're in the beginning phase. If you are saying, okay, no, I've got all that down. That makes sense to me. I, what I'm struggling with is I have all these thoughts and I cannot perform. You are just on the tip about to go into a novice intermediate stage. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So let's kind of bring it back into our own personal journey. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your first initial stage. So, like, not just the beginning stage, but, you know, when you so, very first started, walk me through kind of, like, the mindset that you had um, in terms of c competition and, and stuff like that. So, when I started, um, you know, it was it was fun for me. Like I said in the first episode, my dad got me into it, and I grew up around it. So, it wasn't something that was new to me. I was very familiar with going to shoots. And if I'm being honest, I was about nine years old when I started getting um, to go to competitions and the highlight of my competition was getting checked out of school early to, to nice. leave. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and it was fun for me. You know, it, I got to go with some of my friends. My dad was there. My mom was there. We pulled a camper. We made like a whole weekend trip out of it. Yeah. And it was really fun. I had no cares in the world. I didn't have a middle game. I didn't understand. I didn't even know a middle game existed right. if I'm being totally honest. And, my sole purpose there was to try to copy what my dad was doing because he was really good and see how many targets I could hit in that particular station because mm. I started out in sporting clays. And if there was anything going on at all, like competitive wise, it, it was for me to beat my dad, you yeah. know, and it was for me to try to break at least, you know, half the targets he was breaking because yeah. you have a nine year old versus I don't know how old he was at the time, but But your dad was but good. He was he was he was really good. Yeah, I mean he was he, one of the best shooters in the game at the time. Yeah, he claims that he is the best bird shot in the world. I'll validate that. And I'm gonna <laughs> As a distant second. <laughs> this is gonna be recorded for everyone to hear. But yeah, I I haven't seen a better bird shot. Yeah. Ever. And um I was I was lucky enough to grow up with him being my and I'm gonna say coach because he wasn't an instructor to me he was he was coach he was mm. a mentor he helped me through things but at that stage I was just kind of in this little bubble you know I didn't understand how outside influences could could um, affect me and affect shooting because I was squatted with the same people every time I was squatted with my dad the same every time I was um, we pretty much had the same order that we shot in and yeah. important things to me at that time was getting familiar with my gun, um, traveling to shoot because I'd only ever shot at my house or like mm -hmm. somewhere local. So experience. yeah, it's getting experience, being on the road, traveling. Um, and honestly just kind of getting some experience under my belt. I got to shoot some different games like five stand and the main event and some sub gauge events and just, honestly they're just like trying to learn the game as much as i could yeah yeah if you could go back and talk to yourself then knowing what you know now and knowing that your goal was was your goal at the time to win an olympic medal or did you like you know that that was no it wasn't a goal that was always something that i dreamed of just like oh that'd be cool yeah it was yeah. kind of just like oh wow that would be really cool one day to to do that and then you know, it's kind of like squirrel and I'm on to the next thing. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like I set out and started shooting with that purpose. Yeah. Um, the, if I could go back. Apply I, that filter question. Yeah. If I could go back, I think at that stage being so young, I think I was doing everything. I mean, everything was okay at that mm -hmm. point. You know, things didn't start to veer off. <laughs> 
into, into uncharted waters <laughs> until I started winning. Yeah. Okay. I started winning. I started off winning my class. Um, and and here's what I remember this point in time. There was a shoot that my dad and I went to, and it was at Claythorne. Claythorne, Claythorne Lodge. Lodge. Yeah. And my dad won high overall. And I won high overall in ladies. Mm -hmm. And I think I was 12, 11 or 12. And it was a really cool moment for me. But it was also an eye-opening moment because (laughs) that first thought came into my head. Well, I have now won. I expect to win all the other ones. Yeah. Now, was that a good thought to have? No. Right. (laughs) You know, I mean, but that was that kind of thought. And then when that didn't happen the next shoot... Here come those fear-based thoughts. Here come those thoughts of negativity. And here come those thoughts of, well, I, I, I don't really understand why why I can't replicate that. At the time, were you running any type of program or... No, nothing? not at all. I mean, no, I would say now. So let's start, you know, get from the beginning stage. Let's transition to, okay, like I'm shooting it for two or three years now. Yeah. You know, I'm in my second or third year of shooting and actually trying to compete now. Now I'm aware of my score mm-hmm. and things like who's on my squad, who do I have to be, and what do other people, what are other people shooting? Yeah. Those are the things that I was concerned about at the time, but had no mental game to understand why those thoughts were coming in or even how to control those thoughts at that time. And it did influence how I shot. I mean, I would literally shoot and instantly count up my score and then go at the time, you know, I didn't have a cell phone, but I would go back to the scoreboard and then try to see who shot what that day and what I had to shoot the next day, you know, to to be into it. Right. Would you say that um, if you could apply that filter question that we had, which is right now, what can I do to improve my score the most? Uh, Or what's the next thing I can do to improve my score the most? Would you say that at that moment, would any of that be adding a a, a program to your game? I think looking back, that would have been an excellent time to reinforce working on fundamentals. And mechanical I, fundamentals? Yeah, or, mechanical yeah. fundamentals. And I mean that in, you know, the only reason why I'm focused on a score is because there's not, I don't understand how to, how to train my brain right now to work it. You yeah. know, like I don't have that understanding of what exactly is happening. So if I were able to go back into that stage, or maybe there's somebody listening who's in that phase right now, mm. what I would tell them is, are your like what do you work on in practice what's your practice routine like what does that look like do you practice targets do you practice mounting what do you practice or do you practice hold points go back to what you are practicing right now and imply that in a competition no matter your score yeah forget the score like the score doesn't matter you know forget the score and go back and think okay well i feel comfortable in mounting my gun when I'm supposed to mounting my gun. I feel comfortable in deciding where my hold points are. Take those things and focus on those things throughout your round and let the score be what it's going to be. You know, yeah. don't get so fixated on a score. Yeah. That's what I would tell myself at that time because my mechanics weren't perfect. Right. And but they were something to be worked on because at that time I was feeling a little pressure you know because i wanted to bump up to the next class i wanted to beat my competition so if i could go back i would say focus on your mechanics like give yourself a purpose to work on while you're competing yeah i think that if you're a a shooter who you know your goal is to if right now you're just starting in the game and you say i want to be really good uh, I want to be as good as I can be. Then you gotta you you gotta have a very specific mindset from the start. And I think what you just said is really important because if there's one thing, you know, let's take for example my platinum program for my students. Okay. And if there's one thing that I could, and I use them because it's a level of student to which 
I'm trying to be involved with in everything, mm-hmm. right? And if there's one thing with those guys that I could say, look, I'm going to change the settings on the way that you think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that What I would change it to would be from the very start, don't be product oriented in terms of your score Mm -hmm. because that's huge that's uh, so big when you're in this stage right now everybody is fixated on a score on score i'm missing yeah it's let me just say now guys no matter if you're shooting it for a year or you're going to shoot it for 45 years you're gonna miss right you're gonna miss it's inevitable you're going to miss yeah i've probably missed more targets than anybody listening to this podcast right now yeah you definitely miss more than i have (laughs) yeah but anyways, you know, if you if I could change that and have you start off where just like what Kelly was saying, I asked her, apply the filter question. Mm-hmm. What's the number one thing that you could do right now if you could tell yourself when you were 12 years old to improve your score the most? What would it be? And it wasn't the it wasn't adding a mental program. It wasn't focusing on the mental game. Now, I'm not saying that the mental a mental program is not important or the mental game is not important at that time if you are talking about it in an all-encompassing form of you got to think positive you got to yeah. be that's I mean, there's important little stuff like yeah. you know the chart we we made i would say one of those things um in personality characteristics uh <laughs> nice job <laughs> thank you i'm proud of you personality characteristics to have would be to have an open mind about things that I cannot tell you how many countless times I get a student and I say, okay, first things first, what are you here for? What's your goals? Like, what do you want out of being coached by me? And their response is, I want to shoot a 25. It's immediately on a score. Yeah. Or, and, I mean, do you encounter that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the best is like, I always say this because it helps me. Well, I probably shouldn't tell them. I shouldn't do this on here, but but I'm going to. This helps me get an understanding of the person's mind without re- yeah, kind of tricking yeah, them. Yeah. What I say is, okay, give me an analysis of you as a shooter. Mm-hmm. And that's all I say. And if they say, well, right now I'm a master class shooter and my average is an, uh, 87 and a half. And, uh, you know, I just punched into master class mm-hmm. and extremely product oriented Mm -hmm. if they say well right now i feel like i'm struggling with um you know xyz and my struggling with the right hand target i now have some eye problems or a gun fit issue yeah and i don't feel confident in what i'm using or i feel like the technique that i'm using doesn't really apply to me yeah extremely process oriented shooter open-minded yes and so when i when i ask that question i get that feedback it's like okay well, now I know that you're a product-oriented person in terms of this game. I need to teach you in a way that's going to slowly mold you into what we need to be, which is more process-oriented. So if I have somebody like that, what we're doing is the whole lesson, I, I right off the bat, take them to do the hardest. I want to get them to a bird where they know they're not supposed to hit. Yes. And so we're going to go straight there. And we're going to work on the mechanics. And and I I started off and said, look, we're not here to hit this target because it's really hard. If I were to shoot this, I'd be hitting 50%. Mm -hmm. I don't care about you you hitting or missing. What I care about is your move. So I want you to focus on these mechanics. And I show them the mechanics and I try to get them to do it. And right off the bat, you can switch their perception of what's important. And it goes from the product to the process. And they have an excuse to miss because I told them, you're supposed to miss this. Yeah, I can't. And I, my students, if you're listening, please comment on this on how many times I have said, I don't care if you hit one target during our whole lesson. I don't care. We're breaking it down and we're working on your mechanical fundamentals. So you can, in order to do that, it's going to allow you to be able to have a higher score than if you were to only fixate on a score. Yeah. If that, does that yeah, make yeah, sense? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and so... Go back to what Kaylee said about herself at that time. Um, if you, if you're focusing on, you know, if you go to a match and you're caring about score, 
then you're going to have more of an issue dealing with um, those negative thoughts and they're going to get in the way of the mechanics. Yeah. And, and it's going to negatively influence your performance. I have to tell this story of my student because it's probably my favorite one. And I, and with what happened this morning, I got to bring up uh, this guy. So my, one of my students, amazing guy, his name is Doug Blowers. And I know that he's going to be watching this. Um, Hi, Doug. <laughs> hey, Doug. So he, um, really unique person. And right off the bat, the first initial conversation I had with him on the phone, I, I immediately knew not a product oriented guy. And this is, this is a, half a year before I even had a lesson with him. Um, and so I, I, he didn't shoot NSCA tournaments ever, just started shooting. And I needed a way, after working with him a little bit, I needed a way to gauge his his uh, skill level. Mm-hmm. So I said, Doug, I want you to go shoot a tournament. And and he said, okay, sounds good. So like, you know, he went and shot it. He went and shot an NSCA tournament. I don't think at the time he was an NSCA member. So he shot it as a hunter class, but he went and shot this tournament and called me afterwards and really excited. And I said, Doug, how'd it go? And this is after having a few lessons with him. And he goes, um, he says, it went really well. I said, it, it, really? How, tell me more. He goes, well, it was really good. I, you know, I think that I did really good on specific stations. Um, you know, I was able to do what you uh, were, were t- teaching me really well. Um, I said, awesome. W- what'd you shoot? He, he goes, I shot, I shot good. I said, yeah, but what score did you shoot? He said, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? You just shot a tournament. And he said, I, I didn't keep score. <laughs> like, That's awesome. The whole purpose was to, for me was to send him to a match to figure out his skill level in terms of a score. I needed a quantitative number. But he was just so in he the was moment, so, so in the process. So process-oriented. He went to a match, didn't even think to, to That's score. awesome. You know, it's perfect. If, and he tapped into that unknowingly. But that is how you get those mm. scores. And we had an awesome question come in um, from Reddit. And yeah. we're going to get into that one, which is kind of similar to that story. Um, I th- it's probably the third episode. Yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah. But it yeah. talks about... The question basically summarized, to summarize it, was he? this guy had um, spikes of uh, what I would call... What would you call that? He, he was... Are you talking I, about the... He was unaware of what was going on. He was able to shoot really good and just really dialed in. Felt like, you know, he woke up and he knew that he was going to hit every target when he st- took to the station and just had this bundle of confidence. But then it would it would, it would would leave. And he'd yeah. be like, I have no idea how I ever even tapped into that. Yeah. You know, and li- reading that question, I'm like, oh, I've been there. Yeah. I know that. I, I, I got, you know. Yeah. It's, it's so cool to be able to... To look and read those questions. Yes. Um, but before we get into that, because that one's a hard one, I want to take into. I don't even want to. Let's bring into a. Let's bring a different factor into this. Okay. Ooh. So let's say that you're somebody, and you're kind of like, okay, well, I don't necessarily think about score. That doesn't scare me. What about being squatted with somebody? Maybe you look up to. Maybe mm. you have a big squad, or maybe you're intimidated by somebody. Um, that you're squatted with and this question came from chase thomas thank you for sending that is it on instagram i think so i think it was on instagram and he says ways for new shooters to not get intimidated when shooting with other shooters better than them and my answer to that would be what we just talked about i mean your folk don't focus on you know who you're squatted with because you're not going to influence their score they're not going to they they're not going to influence your score if you don't let them. And go back to your mechanics, what you've been practicing and what you've been working on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a perfect question for this moment in the mental game where you're before the point at which you feel like you should introduce a mental program mm-hmm. because you're not quite at the point where your mechanics are able to be fully subconscious yet. Yeah, but you're experiencing those fears and those thoughts. Yeah, and, and, and it's influencing your score negatively. Mm-hmm. Um, the best way to, to handle that situation is, you know, number one, presence is extremely important. Yeah. Try uh, to stay present. Try to stay calm. Yeah. And you, you got to understand that uh, all of us 
were there. Mm-hmm. I mean, even me. <laughs> even me, like I, like you're excluded from it. Yeah. So, um, but the you know like all of us were at that moment where we were new to the game we were shooting with somebody that was uh you know a really good shooter someone that we really look up to and it's intimidating because you want to show them that you know what you you're do you know yeah. how to do you don't, what you're you don't want to just you know come out and zero a station with yeah. your idol or somebody that intimidates yeah. you watching because then you know that can create a whole snowball of effect of how the rest of the round's gonna go. Right, and then on top of that, you're worried about your bad shooting influencing them. Mm-hmm. And so, number one, realize that anybody that is worth looking up to in that way, uh, and anybody that's gotten to a point where they're considered somebody that would make you nervous. Um, Somebody that's new and struggling on the squad is not going to negatively influence their score. To be honest, if I got a new shooter on my squad that's missing 80% of the shots that he's taking, to me, that's a lot of free show birds. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I could care less if you're missing a lot of birds. The only thing that you want to do, and this is just from a plain sportsmanship aspect of playing the game, is that just be positive. Understand that you're playing a game. It's not a life or death thing uh there's no re- there's no need to uh you know react negatively to a poor performance um that you might want to be worried about influencing somebody's round but if you're having fun and enjoying the moment uh which is easy to do because we're doing something that we all love yeah uh you know don't worry about influencing the other person don't worry about being nervous and understand that that, that other pro there um I mean, has been there. Yeah, they've been there, and and I mean, I personally love to shoot with new shooters because, you know, if you got any questions, ask. You know, you the I'm, when I'm shooting with someone that's new, I'm shooting with somebody that's helping to continue the game that I love. Yeah. So why would I want to discourage that person from participating if it only helps the sport? Yeah. And and if you talk to any other professional, they're gonna say most the same of them thing. would be on the same. Yeah, same page. of course. Yeah, of course. Um. And I just totally forgot what I was going to say there. Um, That's a problem. I, it is a problem because that felt like it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Dang this southern brain. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean. It, it, oh. Yeah. I, nope, I just lost it again. Wow. Wow. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know how to help you there. I'm backtracking. You, you talk. You want me to go? Me, yeah, okay. I'm going to backtrack because it's going to come to me. So, on, on top of that, um, that's a way to help comfort you and, 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 and help you not feel that way. But I also understand that sometimes that's not going to help you. You're going to feel that way anyways. Um, and so the best thing to do is just it, okay. the conscious mind is really easy to distract. Focus on something that's more productive. And, yeah, and, I, that, it came back to me. I okay, was going to say. You go. Because I, I, say, I know I can remember what I'm going to say. Look, take a moment. And if you're starting to feel those negative thoughts, that anxiety, that fear, take a moment and try to look at the bigger picture, okay? Don't just get so fixated on what's happening right now and how you feel. Don't don't create this little bubble of fear, okay? Take a minute and step outside of that bubble and say, okay, does it really matter if I miss every single target to here? You know, right here, is that going to influence whoever I'm intimidated by? No. Um, like David said, they get more free. They get more free targets to look <laughs> at. But just it's 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 not as big of a deal as it seems at the moment. And I know that it seems like a really big deal and it can be intimidating. But just take a step back and look at a, at it as a bigger picture mm. in a whole because. The bigger picture is in six months from now, you're going to think, wow, that, why was I intimidated by that? Or in a year from now, that person's probably not even going to remember they were squatted with you. So, and not in a mean way, but I just mean yeah. it's not as a big deal as it feels like it's in that moment. So just take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and realize it's not a big deal, and then try to go back to what you've been working on in your practice. Right. Amen. Next one, we got another question. Yeah, we do. We have a, a couple questions. And this kind of goes in, it's like we have the same theme here. So this question comes from, so sorry about this, Jolene Carnabucci. 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 There's no R. Yeah? There's no R. Where? Carnabucci. Well, you spelled it wrong. Okay. Sorry, Jolene. 
<laughs> Sorry, Jolene. 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 Okay. Um, she says, how do you focus when you miss a target? Um, I think we've already kind of answered that. That's, that's more fixated on a score. Because when you're focused on um, your score and missing and you miss one, and that kind of sends you into this little vortex of a negative mind, you're focusing on the wrong things. Let me just tell you that right there. Because if you could, if I could apply that filter question to that question that she's asking, mm-hmm. I would say, take, I would say for one, you're going to miss, okay? Because you're in the beginning stages. So you're going to miss. So take those misses and try to learn from that. Learn Okay, did I miss that because my whole point was incorrect? Or did I miss that because I was letting outside things influence me? Did I miss it because I was only focused on running this station and then I missed and now I'm not run I'm, I don't have the chance to run it anymore? What is causing you to be fixated on a miss? And instead of fixating on that, rely on your technique that you're working on in practice. Like Score is going to come. It's going to come whenever it's going to come. It took me a long time to be able to have good scores, I would I would say. But Probably longer than me. Yeah, but, well, you know, I wasn't on ESPN when I started out. <laughs> so, you know, I'm still upset. I'm still a little, a little upset about that. Yeah. <laughs> but but the answer to that is is your your focus is on the wrong thing. It's on a score. It's on a product. It is on a miss. You're scared to miss. Don't be scared to miss. Go back to your, your mechanics, what you're working on, your practice, what you've been practicing on. If you're taking lessons, try to implement something while you're competing that you've been working on. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what would you say? Um, I would, I mean, yeah. If, if, if you miss or you bomb a station or, or I like to call bagel a station. I don't know. Bagel a station? You ever heard those people? I think from, I think it's a New York accent, but they call it a, a bagel. No. No? No. Well, <laughs> that's why I like to call it bagel a station. Anyways. The, so uh, what's a bagel? Are they saying bagel? Ba- but yeah. it's just bagel because their accent? Yeah. Hmm. I thought maybe that would be you. A bagel? Yeah. Ba- ba- Are you know. calling me a bagel? <laughs> He digs his holes deep around here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyways, yeah, I mean, if you experience a lot of, uh, I mean, if you're struggling on a station, let's, let's take the scenario exactly what you're asking. Mm-hmm. You got a four pair station, you call pull, miss, uh, miss the first pair. You got to go into the next pair, you miss the next pair. So you're down four birds, you got two pair left. And the, and the question is, what do I do in that moment? Number one, you can't just ob- obliviously forget about what you just did. And say, ah, mm-hmm. I've got to think positive, just call pull and, and feel good about it. That's not going to work because yeah. you have to run some level of self-analysis to say, why did I miss that? Yeah. Not in a negative way, but to, to, in order to change something to make it better uh, and, and hopefully change the product. But it's all got to be process-oriented. So... What you do is say, okay, well... There's, there's nothing you can do about those misses. Yeah, exactly. So let's recognize that they happen. Yeah, that's behind me. Yep. I can't change that result. Accept so, it, acknowledge it, move on from yeah, it. Yeah, and, and say, what can I do better? And I realize that if I ask myself that question, I can get a little bit more deep in the analysis than somebody who's just starting because I know a lot more about the mechanical part of the game. I know a lot more about the technical part of the game and even the, everything. Mm-hmm. But you at least, here's a really good statement, you know what you know, <laughs> okay? so it's deep. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> right. So whatever you know about the game, apply that knowledge in that moment and try to do what you're doing better. And that's the only thing you can do. Don't up, get upset about it. Don't worry about it influencing your score. Because every moment that you spend thinking about those misses, you're taking away moments spending or that you could be spending on hitting the next ones. Yeah, and that's you're the goal. Only, the longer you spend dwelling on a miss, you're only going to influence and increase your chance of future misses because of your previous misses. And that's what we want to try to eliminate at this stage right now. Like recognize you had a miss, 
forget about your miss and don't let it cause another miss just because you're upset that you that you missed yeah you know mm-hmm um, and there we got a couple questions on that, like how to regain momentum after um, cleaning a few stations than having a really bad one. Uh, that came from Cameron. I would say same thing applies there. Um, any techniques you can share to refocus off coming off a bad stand, I would say the same thing applies there. That one came from Jane Stop. Stoop. Stop. Where do you see these? Right here. Did you make a list where you have the questions and I don't to make yourself look smarter? I don't have to make myself look smarter next to you. <laughs> I don't see these questions. Um, but one question that stood out a little bit more from um, those two questions, and this one came from Jackson. He said, how do you fight the nerves slash pressure going into Sunday of a tournament in the lead? Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, should we... I really want to answer that in a way that's really detailed and yeah that I, way, that might I, I put goes, it on here because I wasn't you don't it's like mess a two, up it's a two part question for me you know it, if you are in this stage right now to where you're still working on your mechanics they're not a fluid movement to you you have to like consciously think about you know your mechanics right now then I would say the same thing as worrying about a miss or worrying about whatever we just talked about applies for this for this question yeah and the second part answer to that question would be a pre-shot routine obviously well i want to answer this in two ways i'm going to give you i'm gonna i'm gonna answer this question through the filter of this being somebody that doesn't have uh, a a mental program to run Mm -hmm. okay I will say, if you happen to get yourself in a position to be leading going into Sunday without a mental program to run, that's pretty impressive. You're probably not a beginner. (laughs) But uh, let's just say that that's the case. Okay. Um, Or even not even going into the lead. It's just an important round for you and or a Yeah, like maybe you're on your personal best for this shoot and you really don't want to screw it up the last day. Yeah. Like you want to keep that personal best going. Yeah. So... With that being said, um, and what I'm going to do is w- somebody with a program and, ha- and having a better understanding of, of, the, of the mental game, um, we're going to answer that question, I think, in the next one. Yeah. Okay, so we'll answer it, we'll answer it through this filter now and through the, a better but filter. But in more detailed next episode. Yeah. Um, so, you know, because I want to keep this in a way to which somebody really basic can understand. Mm-hmm. Okay, the best way to fight that that situation or scenario is understand um, that y- you know you got to have some level of, of self awareness here, consciously your thoughts. If if I were to say, um, that's like that scenario that we brought up earlier on where we're giving Kaylee the, the one shot to, to win an Olympic gold or tie for fourth place. Um, if I were to say, uh, just sit here and talk to her about it for the next year until she's in that scenario, I'm just building up anxiety about it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm putting that moment on a pedestal and creating value around it and making it harder to perform under that, under that situation. Thanks, David. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but if I don't have a mental game, I don't know how to deal with any of that yet. The best way to, to, to tackle that situation is understand that your conscious mind is something that you can control. And so Understand that at, at a super base level, a mental game is a distra- is something to distract you from thinking the wrong thoughts. It's a way to occupy conscious thought to create targeted conscious thought, so you don't have a physiological response in, uh, to to what you're thinking about. So, literally, think about something else. Do something else to distract yourself. Um, I mean, I can go back, think back to times when I was younger, um, and and in scenarios like that, and what I would do, end up doing was just, you know, go out to dinner with friends, uh, 
d- whatever it is, do something get, that get distracts rut- your conscious yeah, get mind. Get in a routine that you're familiar with. If you're familiar every day, like maybe you work out every day. Well, don't be afraid to work out just because you're at a shoot. I mean, you work out every day. Like do things that are going to make you comfortable and you familiar in that situation. So yeah. um, it, what's that quote uh, that talks about if you th- only think of things in the past, you're going to be depressed. If you think about things in the future, you're going to be anxious. But if you think about things that are present or going on right now, you, you can stay in the present mind. You know what I'm talking about? That quote? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much that quote, but I can't remember what that's from. I, I need to look There's another that, one. It goes that the past is history, the future is a mystery, and the present is a gift. Hmm. So think of it right now. There you go. Boom. Boom. I don't know if I just made that up or not, but I I didn't. (laughs) But it's the same thing. So don't don't be stuck in the future creating anxiety. Mm -hmm. Don't be living in the past creating negative thoughts or or even reliving positive ones. Stay present-minded. Think about what you're doing right now. Yeah, I think that um, quote can kind of apply to all the questions that we got and anybody that's in this phase right now, especially when you go back and we're talking about misses or fixated on a score that's in the past now. And that's, that's not going to do anything for you if you get fixated on that. Also this question here that we got, that's talking about how to keep your lead and nerves and pressure going into the last day. Well, if you're thinking about going into the last day in the lead, that's something that that hasn't happened yet. You're not in that. What do you call it? You're not. You're not there yet. You're yeah. anticipating that happening, and that's only going to cause those that pressure feeling and those nerves and those fear-based thoughts that we're talking about. Like, in a fear by fear-based thought, I mean, you know, I hope I can keep my lead up. I hope this. You know, I hope I really don't tank the first station I yeah. hope you know those type of thoughts creep in when you allow them to and you sit there and you think about the future so my advice to you would be to stay present and work on what you're doing in that moment so if you miss a target it's already gone don't stay fixated on it don't look ahead worrying about how you're going to shoot the next day or how you're going to shoot the next event or what or what even might the next station hold the types of targets the sta- next station might hold because that's only going to create anxiety and that's only going to create a negative influence on your mind and physically yeah and then the one thing i would close on that question with would be that uh, so like understand that you have your thoughts will come and go and yes, I understand that a lot of people will say, well, I can't control what what comes into my mind and what do I do if negative things come into my mind? Okay, you in a way you can control it um, in, in, for most people, but if you think that you can't, don't allow negative thoughts to snowball and create more negative thoughts. So mm-hmm. for example, don't say, Don't be sitting there thinking about, I'm in the lead. What happens if I blow it? Oh my gosh, it's going to be so embarrassing. This is something I worked. And then from that, get nervous because of the fact that you're thinking about those thoughts and then cause you to think more thoughts and then say, oh my gosh, I can't get this out of my head. It's going to only go bad and then show up and be nervous and then perform horrendously. Mm -hmm. Okay, understand that negative thoughts will come into your mind. They're going to, it's going to happen. They're going to appear. I deal with them. Yeah. I still deal with them and they will never go away. It's going, yeah, it's going to happen. But then also understand that when it does, let them go. And they can come and they can go. They are manageable in a way that you can have those thoughts and not let it create negative tension in your body. 100%. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the lead of major tournaments going into the last day, even, even walking from one station, from my second last station to my last station and thought like i can still lose this this can still go bad and uh and i don't let that influence i don't let that go any further than what that is i don't add on additional thoughts to it i just let it come i let it go think of something else and until you realize that you what you think about that the the voice inside your head for most people is 
something that you can totally control. That's literally why it's called the conscious. Okay, your conscious mind is something that is at the forefront of what you're doing. It's what you're thinking about doing right now. So if you're think if a, if a thought comes in your head like that, understand and have the wherewithal to say, okay, let's think about something else. I'm gonna try literally do this. Try to see yourself doing what you want to have happen. And then that can totally change the course of your direction of thought. Yeah, and I mean, I can even, and I have some stories to tell for this because it kind of more pertains into our second series, but I went through a time to where I would get anxious and nervous and feel pressure from a shoot that was two weeks out. Mm. You know, I went through a time of just had no idea how to control those thoughts and why they were happening and how it was influencing me. I mean, I obviously felt it influencing me, but I, I couldn't pinpoint why that was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I think, and yeah, it gets deep in the next episode because the next episode is where I went through, and well, you did too because you copied me, um, <laughs> where we went through some challenging times, okay? Mm. Challenging just say, I was scared to pull the trigger at once. <laughs> and you want to load my gun. Yeah. I had so, there, I've had some shoots where I would, I, I could have honestly thrown rocks and done better. Wow. That's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. I've seen you throw rocks. Yeah. I mean, you know, so if you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, that is me right now. The next episode is for you. Yeah. J- <laughs> so, j- I mean, do you want to just get into what the next episode is going to be about? Yeah, the, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, the next episode. So let's recap a little bit. Um, so this episode was for those in the beginning phases that are just starting to kind of that are just starting to break the iceberg of needing a mental game. This episode kind of ep- answered those questions of like, okay, I, I missed one. How do I deal with that? Or how do I deal with pressure and all of that? And we gave you those answers. But the next episode is really going to kind of dig in deeper into how to take those answers and create some sort of mental regimen that is going to be beneficial for you. Yeah, we, we wanted to break this into three stages where we could kind of try to apply it to everybody listening. And we realized that not everybody that's going to listen to this podcast is somebody that has already uh, uh, or even is in the position to where they need to start doing a mental program. When I'm teaching students and I get a brand new person that comes in, hasn't started the game yet, and their first time shooting is with me, or you know maybe just like a month ago they started shooting and, they, and, and, and they're looking for advice, I'm not going to start them off with mental coaching right there. No. Because it's just an absolute overload of, you know, we need to get your mechanics down first i want you consciously focused on the mechanics regardless of the score uh at first because that's how you commit those things to being able to be done subconsciously Mm -hmm. and like we said earlier if you're product oriented early on focus on your score uh focusing on misses yeah do i have the right gun it doesn't matter. it doesn't matter it does not matter right now yeah and so this episode is meant for somebody in that stage where it's like okay i either just started now or i've been doing this for a year or whatever and and i and i don't feel like like when i go to practice i'm still working on my move like a hundred percent there's nothing else i'm working on i'm not dealing with analyzing why i'm missing in a match mentally none of that stuff is happening i don't need to go through a mental program that's what this episode is about and so that's why i mean it's kind of light on the mental game stuff um the uh and that's done on purpose and the way we answer questions is for people in that stage yeah okay so if you're listening to this and you're like man this is like really basic stuff it's because the next episode or the one after that is meant for you um but the one thing i want to say and actually we probably should have said this in the beginning i really do not think that it is possible to just inject yourself into the second or third stage of the mental game Mm -mm. you have to go through all three phases because it's the journey through those three phases that give you the information like the building blocks and of the foundation to build off of when you get to the middle or the advanced stage yeah it's like if you were to think of it 
like building a house. You don't start with the roof or you don't start with the walls. You build a foundation. And yeah. it's the same thing in shooting. You have to build a foundation. And those come from mechanical fundamentals first. You have to learn target presentation. You have to learn the move to that target. You have to learn when and where to hold your gun and to hold your eyes and to basically learn the fundamentals before you can advance into a next stage that requires those fundamentals in order to have that next phase apply to you and, yeah. and, and be a benefit to you. Yeah, when you start getting into the really high end levels of the mental game, uh, there is a there's a marriage between the, the physical stuff and the mental stuff. And it starts to become uh, so that the way you're thinking influences the way you're moving mm -hmm. and the way you're seeing and all those things. And so they start to become one and the same. Yeah. So, but we're not there yet. And so the only way to get there is to understand how they work independently. And you have to experience failure and success independently with that as you go through the journey so that by the time you get to the point where you say, okay, well, I'm in a situation now where... I have to hit this bird to win an Olympic gold, that you understand how if you think a certain way, it's going to make you move a certain way or make your eyes react a certain way. Um, and you can only do that if you experience it through the journey and you go through this you phase. You have the fundamentals. You have to do it. So that's why we're doing it in order this way. And that's why each one is going to be is going to be talked about through the filter and to an audience of someone in this present state. Yeah. Um, so next one's going to be, uh, you know, tenfold more, ex uh, it, it, you know, intimate with the, with the mental game stuff. And the one after that's going to be really exciting. Um, so stick around for those. And even if you don't think, uh, you know, that, you know, if you listen to this and you say, I know somebody that is here and needs to listen to I this. benefit from this. Yeah, send it to share them. Share it with them. Yeah. Reach out to us. Um, like we said in the beginning, we had a lot of uh, feedback from y'all um, that gave us some good things and good topics to talk about because, we, like we said, we want to answer them for you and help give you some insight on maybe – where you're at right now and what's the next step for you to do so hopefully we've answered some of those questions and you come out of this and you're thinking okay that's me i'm in this position and we we got some of those answers for you from your questions um the next episode like david said this is the transition point so right now if you're a beginner and you're thinking okay I was in that stage. I'm still kind of fixated on misses or my score. I understand now how to how to handle that. The next phase is going to be transitioning into the be the I don't want to say the beginning phases, but transitioning into learning yourself and how a mental game applies to you to where you can use a mental game to benefit you in a pressurized situation. Mm. Pressurized situation. Pressurized, yeah. Yeah. Pre like a pressure cooker. <laughs> <laughs> pressurized situation. <laughs> so, uh, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I would say, yeah, the next yeah. episode is going to be... Um, We've covered what it's going to be. Yeah, basically from the introduction <laughs> of, of needing to run a mental game all the way up until the moment when you realize that that mental game that you've worked hard to perfect doesn't work in every situation. Um, and uh, with that... I would say that we're pretty good. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that wraps it up. And um, thank you all again for all, all of the love that you've sent so far. Please subscribe to us. Share it with your friends, your family, maybe somebody that needs to hear this episode. Um, listen to it on, um, I think we're pretty much on all of the podcast apps. If we're not on a podcast yeah, app that you huge. listen to, Please let us know because there are a ton out there oh that I didn't gosh. even know about. There's like a hundred. Yeah. That, so if we're not on one that you like to listen to, let us know. And also don't forget that we video every episode or, or we're going to try to video every episode. But so far we've videoed every episode. So you can head over to our YouTube and watch those um, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. And, and a good way to know, even if you don't want to watch it on YouTube, a good way to know when we update or, uh, or upload a new episode is to, 
to subscribe to the YouTube channel because YouTube and, will notify you. Yeah, hit you got to hit that little bell at the top. Yeah, you tap that notification so you can know when your two favorite hosts here <laughs> host another episode. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and that's a good way to know in in case your your podcast app doesn't um, notify you. But uh, yeah, I mean, let us know. I, but I guess how are they gonna know that we're a podcast if we're not on the podcast app that they listen to well from the youtube social media <sighs> y'all he j- i can't i cannot with him <laughs> if you have some sort of social networking aspect that you can get a hold of us on, <laughs> i like to present you a challenge get, questions get a hold of us because you know what i actually i might be in search for a new co-host <laughs> david may or may not be here next time we don't know i'm up in my price <laughs> he's a He's in charge of getting the coffee every day. (laughs) No, but thank you all again so much, and we hope that you got something out of this episode, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys.